welcome back to session six of Necessary Things. Today we're going to be talking about the inspiration of the scriptures. You know, God didn't give us his word so that it could be locked up from the public in church buildings, which actually happened during the dark ages. Kind of why things were so dark. However, God also didn't give us his word so that we can have four of them on the shelf at the house, but never pick up and read or study or apply any of them. The inspiration of the scriptures is definitely an essential. It's a necessary thing for our faith. If God was powerful enough to send Jesus to the earth through the virgin birth as God in the flesh, powerful enough to defeat death and promise to come back again, then he's certainly powerful enough to give us his pure words to record who Jesus is, why he came, and how it can bring us to peace with God. And he wants us to love his word, to meditate upon his word, and to live his word. 2 Timothy 3.16, which explains the concept of inspiration itself, gives us all sides of this doctrine in a nutshell. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration. And you'll study that in your lesson. This isn't the inspiration to paint the Mona Lisa or to make an awesome Barbie cake for your daughter's birthday or to pen an effectual letter to the editor. Inspiration in this verse is the word theonoustos, which literally means God breathed. So all scripture, every single one of them, has been breathed out by God. That's powerful news for us. But the rest of the verse tells us why. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. God gave us his word so it can be useful in our lives. Every verse in the Bible is equal in inspiration. As you'll see in your notes, they aren't all equal in application. You have to know why the verse was given and who it was given to, to know how you can apply it to your life. All scripture is inspiring and all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let me break those things down for you quickly. Doctrine is simply knowing what's right. Reproof is knowing what's not right. Correction is knowing how to get things right. And instruction is knowing how to keep things right. So God breathed out his words to us that we can make them profitable in our lives so that we can mature in our faith, so that we can accomplish his will in this world. That's why inspiration is a necessary thing. That's why knowing we have the very words of God in our hands, in our own common language, is such a crucial doctrine. About 150 years before the Reformation, around 1370, a pastor in England named John Wycliffe decided that every person should be able to read the Bible for himself or herself. At that time, only clergy were allowed to read the Bible. Bibles were only in ancient languages. Oh, and they were locked up inside of church buildings. Not really the New Testament plan. Well, Wycliffe and a friend of his named John Purvey started translating the Bible into English. And here's what he wrote. Englishmen learn Christ's law best in English. Moses heard God's law in his own tongue. So did Christ's apostles. Makes sense to me. Well, it didn't make sense to the church leaders in London or Rome. And here's what they said about Wycliffe's work. By this translation, the scriptures have become vulgar, and they are more available to lay and even to women who can read than they were to learn scholars who have a high intelligence. So the pearl of the gospel is scattered and trodden underfoot by swine. Obviously, they thought that only professionals should be able to own and know and apply the scriptures. Apparently, they had missed the whole 2 Timothy 3 passage we talked about a minute ago. Or maybe they were trying to hide something. 
Well, long story short, Wycliffe ended up dying from a stroke before he finished the work, and so Pervy completed it the rest of the way. But Wycliffe is known as the morning star of the Reformation, because the scriptures in the hands of the common people would lead to worldwide change. God did exactly what he had always said he would do through his word. And the powerfully sharp sword of the scriptures penetrated hearts and pummeled leaders all over Europe. Interesting little tidbit about Wycliffe. Church leaders were so mad that he had the audacity to think common people could have the scriptures that 43 years after his death, they dug up his body, burned his remains, and threw the ashes into the river Swift. You might say they held a grudge. But defiling Wycliffe's body did nothing to stop the march towards scripture for every man. We could talk about Gutenberg and the printing press, or William Tyndale, who was the first to translate the Bible into English from the original languages of Hebrew and Greek. Wycliffe had translated from Latin. Tyndale's translation become one of the, became one of the main tools that 47 brilliant scholars used in the early 1600s to translate the King James Version. Oh, I forgot to mention, Tyndale was handsomely rewarded for his work in getting the Bible to the common man. His friend, Henry Phillips, betrayed him to Bishop Stokesley. He was seized in Antwerp, held in a castle in Belgium, and tried on a charge of heresy, and then condemned to be burned at the stake. Tied to the stake, he was strangled and then burned. His final words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Well, God answers prayer. Listen to this. Within four years, four English translations of the Bible were published at the King's request. Now, in your lesson, you'll notice that I recommend a couple of books that your group may want to do as a study during the summer. One is about the unbelievable history and scholarship behind Bible translation. It's called God's Secretaries. It's by Adam Nicholson. And I think you really enjoy this book. Uh, the other one that helps answer questions on why there are so many Bible translations out there today and how you can discern what's best to use. Uh, it's called A More Sure Word, and it's by R.B. Ule. Well, I've really enjoyed our time together in Necessary Things. I hope you have too. The essential doctrines of God's Word aren't just there for us to know. They are there to be the foundation of what we do. Let's get to doing.